uh, so what is Arlo one? Uh, we are basically trying to decentralize real-time communication. Uh, like IPFS is trying to decentralize file storage for the world. We are trying to decentralize real-time communication for the world. Um, I think um, I will try to keep this talk very specific to the protocol versus product argument which we'll have. Um, so I so this is what we have to think. So protocol has to serve the product or the use case. So um, so the life cycle we have gone through is we built product, we built more product. After we built more product, we refined it, then we made it modular, and that is what led to the protocol. So we I call it the circle of life. <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, product, feedback, better product. Yes, so uh, this is both of our co-founders, that's Sushmit, that's Ayush. That was the first iteration of Cadbury, which is now Hudlow One. And this was the, uh, this was the application they gave at HackFS uh, in 2020, where they got approved for the grant to then be incubated by Protocol Labs. And as you see here, it's been four years we've building we've been building this, and you can see the circle where we started from there. We kept on iterating on design with user feedback, and now we're at a stage where it is uh, a close competitor to uh, all of those uh, close source and uh, traditional alternatives which are using centralized services. Uh, this was uh, our old dashboard. And same product feedback, talking to a lot of people, uh, the feedback led to the new dashboard. So our whole philosophy has been trying to address people first and the demand first, and then trying to backtrack and see what are the modularities we can provide as a protocol to enable more people. So for that, we had to first address demand and see what the people want. Uh, so once we figured out our main like product, which became like a top funnel for people to use Hardlow One because they started trusting the infrastructure because it actually worked. Uh, we started designing SDKs to allow more people to build on top of the same infrastructure. And that is, I think, which was a turning point when we realized we're not just Zoom for Web3, but we can actually build down, go down modularity, and also serve, use the same infrastructure to serve more people. Uh, so uh, this is the community building Farhouse, which is uh, which brought audio spaces to Farcaster, so Twitter spaces to Farcaster, and uh, internally we build like a lot of fun projects. So internally at Hadlo One we have a internal calling tool, so we don't use phone calls, we use Daenerys. So uh, you put in uh, a person's number or DID, and you just call them. So if you want to call me, you have that number, and you write Arush K dot eth. So I just get a call on my phone. Uh, so we do that a lot, and then we were just so we have been in a process of trying to understand what people want from real-time communication, uh, and that is where after we've maybe found out okay these are the set principles or core core values people are looking for, we went from this monolith kind of architecture where we were thinking of trying to solve for the user first, to now realizing what are the core tenets people are looking for and be able to modularize it. And this led to the protocol. So now that to this was a transition which was kind of based out of the user feedback we got over time. And modularity now leads to protocol. So uh, now that we know what people are looking for, we were able to build different pipelines and social network effects to people for to build on top of the SDK and directly use Hudlo One, but at the same time we want people to also uh, the world to also be onboarded to the DRTC network. So we've onboarded a lot of people who from Web3 who who gave us the first attempt or tried Hudlo One and found it useful and hence converted. Now we're not only looking to onboard Web3 but also onboard the world to DRTC, which, in, uh, which includes Discord, WhatsApp, Zoom, Twitch, and all the CDM platforms to allow them to use cheaper, de cheaper decentralized infrastructure for their audio video needs. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, uh, can I go back? Uh, and this is what Drake calls the God's plan.
So uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is B5, uh, Brendan in Meatspace. Uh, I'm here to tell you about an open source project. We work at a company called Number Zero, uh, and the open source tool we make is called Iro. It is a toolkit for shipping user agency at speed. Uh, user agency, meaning we really are focused on the core benefit of this tool being a meaningful degree of control over your experience of a high-end app. Uh, at speed, we really focus very much with our tooling on enhancing the amount of time it takes you to ship something meaningful. Uh, it's a very important part of what we do. Uh, but that doesn't really answer what Iro is in practical terms. In practical terms, Iro is these four components. No, most of our projects do not use all of these, but we have things for syncing state, broadcasting messages, transferring data, and connecting devices. Uh, the connecting devices part being easily the hardest part. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of what Iro is at a high level. Just to help understand, we do have real world use of this. We're on more than 300,000 devices at the moment. We're doing 170,000 average connections a month. I'm proud to say that that is on our public infrastructure. There's a lot more happening on infrastructure that is not run by us, which helps support the federation principles of this. We have more than 22 projects building on us. We're in all the major app stores, and we have lots of repos that have grown to very funny sizes, and people telling us that they need to make them bigger, and we need to make everything more optimized, uh, which has been a delightful experience. <laughs> But all of that is hopefully just to sort of plug into this protocol discussion. And for us, Iro is a very uh, specific uh, take on the broader IPFS vision. And we've really been trying to optimize for reliability. Iro is designed to be a thing that people build on top of. The more reliable it is, the better. The less reliable it is, then that unreliability is passed on to the application space. And Getting to the position where something just works takes a long time. We focus really hard on building an experimental loop. And it also has meant from, to inform the protocol discussion that we have had to put a lot of energy and effort into being careful about what protocols we do rely on. And for that, we turn to stuff that already exists. So most of Iro is built on existing specs that you've heard of, Blake 3, Quick, uh, even specs. Uh, we're working towards specs like hole punching inside of Quick to try and align some of these things. Uh, and that is hopefully in entirely around the purpose of reliability. That's kind of the core of what we're focused on. Uh, so for us, having it just work takes a lot of time, energy, and effort. Uh, and that's really the thing that we drive for all day. Um, but it has really forced us to narrow down and focus on the way that we think about protocols and the selection of what protocols to rely on. So hopefully that plugs into this discussion, but that's all we have. Hello, everyone. My name is Colfax, and I'm a software engineer with the Privy team. And our mission is to make blockchains more usable and protocols more usable. I really resonate with a lot of what the previous panel was talking about around making the technology and the terms and everything a little bit easier to understand. So we build an SDK for blockchain applications to integrate so that their users, whether they have a wallet or not, can use their application. And I'll talk a little bit more about our product in a minute. So there's really a tension between security and accessibility sometimes. And our goal is not only to make these systems accessible, but make them accessible in a secure manner. So a quick overview of what I mean by security. The first principle is nobody can access your wallet. And the second one is you actually won't lose access to your own wallet. And from an accessibility standpoint, we also want you to be able to access your wallet and you to understand how it works or at least how to use it. And we like to say sometimes, sometimes the most secure system is actually one that's not usable at all. So I'm gonna introduce a quick analogy. Uh, so I'm from Boston, and in Boston we call Metro cards Charlie cards. And a Charlie card or a Metro card is a very accessible system. So you store some money on it, you tap it when you wanna enter the Metro. Uh, not super secure, but it, the security actually meets the use case for the Metro card. So you're not gonna have a whole lot of money on there, certainly not your life savings, uh, and you can use it very easily. A bank vault, on the other hand, is extremely secure, but not very accessible. So if you were to store your money for paying the metro in a bank vault, it would be extremely difficult to use. So what we build at Privy is an SDK that really has two core parts to it. Uh, our target users are users that are building on top of blockchains or uh, other protocols. And Basically, what we offer is we offer one side of our product is wallet connectors. So if you have a wallet already, your users can use their wallet to connect. And the other side is actually uh, traditional Web2 authentication mechanisms. So think about login with email, login with Spotify, login with LinkedIn, things like that. And if a user comes to your application, 
without a wallet through one of these social login methods or Web2 login methods will actually create one for that user and they can start using it right away without learning how to back up a seed phrase and things like that. Now that being said, within our customer base, we have a wide array of different use cases for why their users need wallets. And so our SDK is built on top of a secure self-custodial wallet infrastructure that's shared across all of our customers. But within each app, each customer can tailor the user experience to their specific use cases. So on one hand, on the hyper accessibility side of the spectrum, you can think maybe if you're building a blockchain based game, in order to have a good experience, you might not want a transaction prompt for like every single move in the game. So we have some features available for doing <coughs> some cases of promptless signing when the user's online. On the more hyper secure side, say if you're building like a DeFi application or something more sensitive, on the totally opposite side of the spectrum, we actually also have support for transaction MFA. So in order to send a transaction, the user needs to authenticate with a separate authentication mechanism. We like to talk about this concept called progressive onboarding a lot. So both a user's journey entering into using blockchains and protocols will change over time. And then also within an app, a user's experience using that app will also change over time. So we want to build flexible tooling to allow a user to be met where they are and be educated over time. And that the different use cases and the different like security mechanisms securing their account can actually grow with that user based on how use cases and usage changes. So that's a quick little overview of what we're building. We are doing a workshop on Saturday. I think it's at 10 a.m. if you'd like to learn how to use our SDK. And I'll be sticking around uh, after this to answer any questions. And feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to chat with you. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Sriracha. Uh, before I get started, there was a bit of a miscommunication on my part. So I had to put this together really quickly, the net result of which is that I may be a little hot takey, and if I say anything that upsets you, feel free to come, uh, you know, cash me outside. So, uh, cool. All right. So, yeah, uh, we all know that the internet is running on servers. There's no cloud. Uh, it's all, all a bunch of computers out there, and we're all putting our data on all those other computers. And this is how the internet works. There's only one problem, which is that the servers bring a lot of bad things. Um, I'm stealing this from uh, Brendan's intro, uh, Iro intro, but yeah, everything goes wrong when you put it on a server, even though it's the only way to do it. You lose control of your data, it goes into a giant silo, and uh, that's not good. Um, uh, there's a lot of approaches we can attack this problem with. One is that we can stop being so reliant on servers. There's a lot of reasons we don't need servers, and that's a, that's a super valid and awesome strategy. But eventually, you're gonna need servers uh, in some fashion if you really wanna build things at scale. Um, and so that's how I kind of got into IPFS. I was like, this IPFS thing looks like maybe you could do this and um, get rid of, and maybe avoid some of these problems. Um, so yeah, so I started working on IPFS in 2008. Uh, I uh, really wanted to fi fi fix the internet, so uh, I worked on BitSwap for a while. I did not fix the internet. Um, so I went on, I was like, no, I'm gonna write a new data transfer protocol. Uh, so I, I, I didn't come up with it, but I, I implemented it. I wrote some graph sync, still did not fix the internet. Uh, I was like, now nah, I'm gonna go over and write some Filecoin, uh, yet to fix the internet, but it's 2024 and this time it's personal. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we're gonna do it. Um, yeah, so Storacha. It is, uh, Storacha is a super hot, decentralized data storage network at scale. What does that mean? It means IPFS that just works. Um, that, that is what we want. We wanna build you a content address system you can use and uh, build applications on without having to think about almost anything in this ecosystem that, that all of us know, and all the cool terms that we have in our heads. So. Um, yeah, it's super hot. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna be reusing this meme because I'm bringing back 2006 or something, whenever this was uh, the meme of choice. Um, the other thing about Storacha is that Storacha is user-owned data. Um, we are, when you interact with the Storacha network, you are essentially giving someone the right to hold your data. You're also probably paying them to do it. But like you, you are not delegating 
complete control over your data, you're delegating the right to hold your data and make it accessible. Um, and this is using a technology called UCANS, and it, fall, it flows throughout our entire stack. Because our core pro premise is that when you put your data on a server, you, are, you should still be the person in control of that data, right? Um, and so that's the, the core of our technology stack. Um, to get there, we, I, I, I have this theory that like, you know, we, we have so, many, so much technology in IPFS, but IPFS is also not done, right? And I think we need not just a content address web, but a user-owned content address web. What that means is it's not just that you're putting a, you know, a data that you can look up via SID onto the internet. You also, have, you also need to understand who, it, who, whose data is it and who created it and what, what can and can't happen with that data. Um, I think that's critical to, to empowering folks to uh, use use IPFS in ways that work for, with, for them. Anyway, if this feels controversial, this is the super controversial version of this meme, which is that if you start with SIDS, you're not done, but if you add UCANs, you might get something cool. Uh, come to my talk tomorrow about UCANs uh, and uh, how they are awesome. Uh, cool. Um, how do we do this? We're built on Filecoin. Uh, that's actually gonna be the core of our storage network. And you're like, what Filecoin is cold storage? Not true. Lots of our storage providers are ready to do hot retrievals for, for the IPFS network. What they need is a mechanism by which to do that and be incentivized to do that, and that's what we're doing. Right. Cool. It is available right now, Storacha. It's actually, called, it's actually Web3 dot storage for the time being. Yes, that, it's us, it's us. It's the Web3 storage team bringing you Storacha. Um, we are, over the next year, gonna be heavily evolving this into a truly network-based solution. Right now, a lot of the infrastructure is basically all, all run by us and, and all run on, um, on cloud platforms that I will not mention. Um, but that's gonna be changing a lot over the next year. Um, we think we've got the, the, the groundwork laid. And yeah, come, come, come follow along with us, yeah. Um, well, we talked about rough edges of Web3. What was the, what, for each of you, what's, what was the trickiest one that you had to overcome? I think for us, maybe the trickiest edge was, uh, so we started four years ago, and uh, Web3 UX was not as great. We didn't have Privy at the time. So uh, it had been a process trying to on board even Web3 users onto the platform and to new resources. And we had uh, we had doubled down on uh, wallet addresses and crypto primitives as the go-to standard for us to build on top of. And the, the journey of the user experience there was a journey. So we had to first ourselves, like we had to build internally something very similar to Privy to make that work, and this was four years ago. And now I think we've got much better tooling to facilitate onboarding of Web2 and Web3 users onto crypto native platforms. So I think that was the rough edge that we had to solve internally for four years ago. But I think now that everyone's focusing a lot on onboarding the new set of people and user experiences onto uh, Web3, I think that's being solved for pretty well. Yeah. yeah. And one thing I was very impressed with uh, the most recent version of Huddle is that if you don't have a login, you can just type a nickname for yourself and get right yeah. in the call. Yeah. So much faster than Zoom, faster than creating an account. Yeah, just to add, add to that, um, I totally agree. And something that I've learned very tangibly is it's very, it's not natural for a user to have to store like a secret, like a mnemonic or a password. Um, themselves like there's no reset password button for your wallet and the the difference between like oh i only need to reset my password like once every 10 years to never being able to do it is a very difficult hurdle to get past and an example is like i wanted to give a po app to my family a po app proof of attendance protocol it's like a little nft that represents a celebration or an event that you went to i wanted to give it to my family for christmas one year and alongside that, I also gave them an hour long session to explain them how to set up a wallet. And I went through every single family member and it was extremely challenging to get people to the point where they even understand why they need to keep this mnemonic safe. And so I'm really excited about all the progress that we're making to make blockchains more usable because that's the only way we're gonna actually 
enable these novel and important use cases that use uh, these new protocols and blockchains and storage mechanisms to have positive impact. And um, we have someone on our team who has asked her entire family to install Arch Linux. I'd like to know what is harder, explaining how to configure a wallet or Arch Linux. You know, like what I don't even know. Yeah, those, those are fun dinner party conversations. Uh, yeah, I mean, for uh, speaking personally, uh, developer velocity is my biggie. Um, when we uh, number zero and Ira was born out of me trying to build a project prior to this called Query, which is a data set for control tool. And we got smoked in the market by a bunch of Web2 competitors who just didn't have to look down the stack in the way that we did. And so we spent a lot of time actually not focusing on protocols, but focusing on APIs, SDKs. How do we really reason carefully about an abstraction that does not require the user of that API to understand what is happening under the hood? And that, for us, takes so much more time and effort and you really start to look at like some of the genius of things like HTTP, which is a stateless request response interaction that just obfuscates a whole class of problems when you introduce statefulness to a connection. And so these things are really hard to design and trying to outdesign them is very difficult. Um, but if you, we've really tried to focus on being in a really tight loop with people building on top of IRO and we take their feedback incredibly seriously. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about the um, Dune scene of the person with their hand in the pain box. That is kind of what it feels like to get user feedback sometimes around these protocols, where it's just like, okay, it hurts, but we just continue to listen because it will make us stronger. Uh, <laughs> I want to think of my entire career in this world now. It's just all being, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I have uh, just two, two things. One is, um, one is no is is finding ways to ship these tools without inconveniencing people. Um, uh, and like one of the big changes that we've made in in Web three storage is switching from doing the content addressing and data preparation on our servers to do to making it to having users do it themselves, which is critical to delivering the guarantees that we want to deliver. Because like if you're not contact if you're not hashing it yourself, you're trusting us, which is not what we want to do. Doing that. Shipping that in a way where we're not inconvenience, in, can, inconveniencing people took a year, right? Um, and still, we're still work in progress. Um, and then the, the other part of that, uh, the other thing that I think is really a challenge is figuring out when do you need to take a risk on something new, right? Um, so, like, I mean, we're in content address IPFS land, so everything's risky and new. However, there's like moments where it's like, am I gonna, am I, do I need to come up with a new way to do a thing? Um, which is like, you know, 99% of the time the answer is no, but if the answer is yes, you have to do it and you have to figure out when that is. Yeah. So. Thanks. Any, uh, does that spark anything from, from the room? So the question was, how close are the products that we're building now uh, to what drove us to the space? Um, I'll comment on that just quickly. I was, I'd been following developments like in decentralization and blockchains for a number of years, but it never really clicked with me until, believe it or not, actually DeFi summer, so like in 2020, when I finally started to get an inclination of how this is going to have an impact for broad like general users and it's not just going to be an interesting tech tool but like this actually can be impactful to help like bring uh financial infrastructure to places that don't have it and so this is very intimate what i'm working on now is very intimately involved with sort of my excitement about the space and actually solving real problems for end users in a way that is much better than the solutions we have today uh hi uh, i think uh at least from the perspective of hardlo one and the products we build uh, we're not there yet in the sense that uh, maybe the consistency or the quality of communication over the platform is as good as uh, Web2 alternatives, but it really is the point of uh, trust or like the least inconvenience possible. Uh, for example, where when you're joining a meeting or using Zoom, whatever, uh, it is a one-step process and you don't have to go through the same process of explaining someone what Web3 is, what wallets are, etc. So the way, the, the day we reach that stage where uh, Web3 is not the reason you're coming to a platform, but it's maybe more privacy-centric and it's just a equal competitor to the Web2 landscape, 
I think that is when we would say the products are at that level where people are differentiating you uh, based on the use case you bring, just like Telegram, WhatsApp, Zoom. There is no, they're all equal in some senses and then there are different feature sets which people talk about. So I think when we are at that scale where people are talking about Web3 products and use cases at the same level because of the amount of, uh, because we bring feature parity, I think the way we reach that and the we reduce the level of inconvenience, I think maybe that's the day our products will be there, that level, if that answers the question. And Brendan, uh, your team r wrote this thing twice, right? You wrote it once and then you decided that was not right and then you and wrote it again. Did it again, yeah, we did. And, and this was really based on this optimized for it should just work. We just need devices to connect to each other. And we did it once and it was like, did that this does not have that characteristic and this does not have the performance characteristics that we want and so we have to try again uh and we did we're happy with the second try but uh yeah we, we, for more descent <laughs> yeah. or, or or ascent i don't know pick your altitude it's always painful but sometimes it's less painful now than six months from now absolutely yeah and i think that it, you know and there's absolutely no way we end up here without the iterative lessons we've learned along the way like, I think this is truly a 25 year project. Like we're not, like it's gonna take a long time to figure out a new abstraction that scales to internet scale. Like that's bonkers. And, and so like, I, I think we'll be blinding out the obvious when we figure, them out, figure out the ideas, but it's, <laughs> it's a long process. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm working exactly on what I s intended to work on when I got in here. The different, the main difference in terms of my journey is that I came in as a Web2, pure Web2, ho-hum software developer uh, and was just powering myself off of hubris and, uh, <laughs> and like not and, pret and, pret and pretending. And now I think I might know one or two things, but I don't know if I really know those things yet. Um, uh, like, like Brendan said, I, I, sometimes I feel like part of the joy, of also the pain of working on this stuff is that, it, yeah, you feel like you're working on something that's a 25 year project and like, Maybe at the end of it, you'll be like, wow, I'm really glad I did that. Maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. Stay tuned to find out. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much to all these panelists. <laughs> and for questions.